program on negotiation was the first interdisciplinary center on negotiation in the world. In 1983, the program helped develop an entire new field of negotiation research and teaching. PON has fundamentally changed how people view conflict and handle disputes. On the Ecuador Peru boundary, where I was working with the president of Ecuador at one time. From shaping the peace process in South America to conceptualizing a multi-door courthouse, the program has had major influence at home and abroad. Twenty years after the formation of the program on negotiation, the founders sat down to share their thoughts, reflecting on the field they helped to create. The program was born under the umbrella of the threat of nuclear war, mm -hmm. which at least for me was, uh, was, uh, was a major motivation for getting into this field. For me it was a problem of war, but in, in, in particular, uh, well, I, the nuclear war was, was definitely a, a kind of an element there, of that there had to be some better way of dealing with our differences, otherwise we might extinguish ourselves. I taught competitive decision making in the business school, and then somewhere along the line I happened to see Derek Bach, the president of the university, and he asked me, what do I think about the stuff that Roger Fisher is doing? <laughs> and I said, I don't know very much about it, but, but let me look and let me uh, report informally to you. And I looked and I got intrigued. Uh -huh. And it was because of the stimulation of that question of Derek that Bach. said, I want to seek out and work with Roger. I mean, my motivation for coming over in the very first instance was, hey, we're succeeding in the city planning world. We're getting tons of people to come out and participate. Now we're in trouble. We don't have the slightest idea what to do now that we got them all to participate because they all want different things. And we have absolutely no idea in our practice of what to do about that. That's what drew me up to find out what you guys had figured out about that. Mm -hmm. Now, why did this particular constellation stick. I, I, I remember Howard once, I don't know, remember once he was saying to me, you know, I go into every field, I only stay five years, right. that's it, and then I go <laughs> <laughs> Oops. And, and so, you, you, you know, you, know we, you were already predicting what was going to be your next field after negotiation, yeah. and we all got stuck. The original intent yeah. was, as Roger described, which is bring the parties to the dispute in and get some folks to give them advice. My impression, in hindsight, was that Kennedy, yes, was looking for the advice. We give both sides the same advice to both right. sides. You yeah. might have two people there. And we're not saying we're coaching you on how to win, on how to bluff, mm -hmm. how to mislead, how to pad your demand, how to be tough, into changing it from one-sided advice into the best advice we give both sides. We were going from practice to theory. Uh -huh. And I think we all shared that inclination. Uh -huh. 
Go look at something, see what happens, then try to formulate what you can from it, and then go out, get, try giving it as advice, test it again, and see what happens. Where the rest of the university was going from theory to someone else doing practice. And we were saying, bring the practice in here. Let's look at it. Well, and it, in part, it led us to think a little bit about what kind of theory is most useful to practitioners. What I've always admired about this group is they're going to do it. They're not going to retreat behind, okay, this is high theory, nobody else can understand it. It's can I take what I think I've abstracted and can I take what I think is in fact the challenge and bring that together. That's what's been so appealing about this over time. And another part was the pursuit of looking at the essence of problems. When you got a real problem and got gave advice, you didn't leave it, but you, you played around with it until you can get the essence out. Like the essence being of joint gains is the orange with the pulp and the rind. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, made me think of you that you were a kindred mathematical spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I think uncommonly in academics, there was a an interest in speaking to a wider public outside of academia and trying to reach practitioners with our writings. Uh, that's fairly, uh, at least at that time, was, was uncommon. Uh, and where, you know, most, most academics just talk to other academics. And our first tendency was not to go to the literature, but to go to the wealth of cases at the business school and looking for cases of that ilk. And then it was, the abstraction out of that led to Jim and mm -hmm. David's book mm -hmm. on the manager as negotiator. Right. Uh, again, it was stemming from the, the rich examples. We just went around and systematically surveyed and met with probably dozens of Kennedy School and business school and other faculty saying, do you have any cases, particularly detailed ones that have a kind of an anthropologist's thick descriptive touch, that have people who are interdependent and some difference in perception or interest, and if in fact they might they have the chance of doing something better jointly than they could solo or otherwise. You know, we did also follow some of our own advice. I mean, I, I remember we would occasionally invite other academics like you know the Nadav Safran or someone to these devising seminars and we had rules that you you couldn't criticize ideas you had to build on them you couldn't change the subject that was one of the harder ones for people to follow and we always used flip charts and recorded things visually to keep to sort of reinforce that and and I remember Nadav being quiet for like the first hour and somebody said, well, what are you thinking? I said, I'm trying to get my brain around the rules because every time I think of something to say, I want to criticize what just got said. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, it did help the, the interaction to, to enforce the no changing of the subject. I guess one of the questions on that Bill put for us is uh, what has this meant to you personally? I, I mean, I've found PON a tremendously enriching place. I think mean, it's hard to see what one's life would be like without it. I think there's a lot of stimulation from people with different perspectives, uh, worrying about the same problems and the sort of, I guess, what we've had here in microcosm is what PON has been about for the last 20, 25 years. Um, and I think that's very rich, valuable experience. I think one of the reasons everybody found various kinds of nourishment here is that we all also maintained a series of uh, individual or in some cases group enterprises that spun off from the place. In my view, the reason people come back here is to find good ideas that they can then go apply and we don't have to <coughs> force any kind of agreement here about what we want to work on outside because we have a whole set of individual activities and connections outside that where we can pursue what we want to pursue. We bring pieces and parts back in for scrutiny from everybody, but the, the fact that those activities allowed us to make a bigger impact on the world meant that people could use what they were getting here in a way that allowed them to shape what they wanted to do in the world outside.